So I do three, three levels of passwords, no importance. The New York Times password for many years had no importance to me. It was important to the New York Times that I have a password. I didn't care. You could have my password in the New York Times and steal my non-account access to it. It was okay. Now, it turns out these things change over time. Um, so you have to watch and rethink it. So then, then there's sort of a second level. The inconvenient is stolen, but it's not a disaster. So that's level two. And level three are the hard ones. Major problem if it abused stock accounts and bank accesses. So I usually tell grandpa to pick three different passwords. Um, and it's okay to write them down. The Do you work and social? Okay, so, so you have two. You have one for social and one for work. I have almost nothing in social that comes close to the top security stuff. I, I have different strong passwords for work and for my bank slash stock account stuff. Um, but there are similar hard, there, there are strong passwords. And I will be talking a bit about if, if you really need strong passwords, I'll talk about those in a little while. Um, and there are variations. It's okay to write it down. I mean, most attacks for grandma, grandpa, the attack is coming from Latvia or Russia or someplace. They're not in his house looking at his post-its notes. Yes, I suppose the maid or your office mate at work might look at them. Um, but for the most part, this is not the usual way things are stolen. They can be for directed attacks, of course. Um, and if you do write down the password, I don't write it exactly down. It's a little different. I make it so you can't just copy it. That gives you another layer. You have to fiddle around with it. Um, should you save them on passwords with Firefox or something like that, these password vaults? Well, if they get a hold of your machine, there is deep down inside a dictionary attack that can run on your passphrase, um, which is a concern. It's a concern when I run this. I use authentication off this Mac, but there are two pieces of it. There's the public key in here for my SSH, and there's the passphrase I use to unlock it, which I make sure is not stored in here. I've just recently disabled SSH agent. Um, for Snow Leopard because they insisted on keeping it, keeping these passphrases. I don't want that. I want to type it each time. So if the bad guys get this, they at least have a big dictionary attack, I hope, to, to get this stuff. That exists in Firefox, you put the master password versus the right. Password. That's right. And the master password is something that if I have access to your, to your machine, if I steal it, for example, not watching your keystrokes, I can run a dictionary attack on the master password. Uh, e even if it is, um, I've, got your, I've got your bits, okay? So at least in principle, either now or later, I'm going to be able to figure it out. Um, for implementers, and I assume that, I, I, I put in several slides here, because I assume there are implementers in this room. Um, get out of the dictionary attack game. Uh, counting and managing authentication attempts. How many people have heard, I mean, Almost all of you have heard of Pam, right? That, that was Sun. It's a great idea. How many have heard of Pam Tally? Not many. I hadn't. I said, gee, there ought to be a Pam module that counts login attempts and shuts the account if there are too many. And I went and looked and found Pam Tally was written in 1998. And Pam Tally 2 was two years thereafter. It's already in there. You could put this in for your SSH authentication or anything else. Now, I looked at Pam Tally, and if I'm grading the paper, I give him a D. Uh, I'd like... I doesn't have it. We did it a different way. Did it a different... Okay, but... The, the architecture is there, but it's at the wrong place in the stack. Uh-huh, okay. Um, and, and in fact, I wasn't really thrilled with the code. It needs to be redone. But the idea of having a module that lets you count passwords is a great one. Um, and of course, you could slow the account access down, something Login's been doing for 30, 25 years, maybe. Uh, your third guess, you're, you're waiting 10 seconds or something like that. That's okay. I like that. And maybe the fourth guess should be an hour. Um, and another thing you have to do is blacklist inquisitive IP addresses because you can't just lock the account. I may try it from many different places. The other thing is the account name should not be too predictable because I can search many accounts with one password. Um, locked account is better than a stolen account for most uses. Slower authentication, yeah, I just talked about that. Okay, centralizing the security, use an authentication server. This is, authentication servers are not hard to write. 
I mean, they can be, but they, in principle, they're pretty simple pieces of code. They're a little bit of crypto and a database and some thought. It's even, I've been arguing with myself on this for 20 years about whether there should be multiple authentication servers. Because one, you can keep up. It's a simple machine. Okay, well, what happens if it goes down and everything goes bad? Yes, that's a problem, so you don't let it go down. The, on the other side, if you have multiple ones, you have this um, synchronization problem. You've got to make sure that each one knows what the other one's doing, and that greatly complexifies, and biggins the problem. Um, so I, I prefer single ones if you can possibly do it. Uh, replication is dangerous. If the password is forgotten, use the user supplied reminder for the primary password. Do not allow the second weakened, weaker one. I said that already. Net has an ancestor. Yeah, that's right. Black, blacklisting doesn't have to be forever. Maybe you come back in an hour and try another password try. Here's another one, a, a pet peeve, sit peeve. A pin is not a password. These words get intermixed. A pin is numbers only. It's a personal information number. A password might have both. Uh, when I go to a place that says enter your PIN and they mean password, I'm thinking this place doesn't let me use, uh, it's a PIN so there must not be letters in here and I have trouble remembering it. And in fact, more important, the, uh, the server that you're talking to ought to give the rules even if you're not logged in. Hi, I'm the AT&T internal single sign-on computer. Here are my strong password rules. It leaks a little bit of information, but it mostly helps people who are trying to log in who may have forgotten the details of this. Oh, right, they don't allow spaces on this one, that sort of thing. Um, it eases usability a lot, and that's what we're aiming for here. Don't make the account names too easy to guess. If I'm pretty sure that your password is the word password, uh, or someone's is, and I can guess every account name in a bank, I can run through and start checking different account names with the same password, sort of invert the problem. Um, social security numbers are too guessable. Secret rules, uh, yeah, I had a bank, the user name was your social security number. With or without dashes, well, we're not going to tell you. That's a secret, we don't want to leak that information. So you type your social security number, and you pick wrong and you try your password a couple times and it doesn't work in the account locks. Um, this, this is just a pain in the neck. Go ahead and say, enter social security numbers with dashes or without dashes if you care. In my world, it would just ignore the dashes and the spaces and stick it together. If you give me nine digits, you've given me a social security number, I can go for there. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, near public authentication servers, OpenID, OpenAuth, I like this idea. This is, a, there are a bunch of these like this. Biometrics. Of course, the ultimate biometrics is DNA. And unless you have a twin, that is pretty darn close to 100% accurate if the test is accurate. But we're not there yet. And there's still a lot of troubles with these. Some of you may have seen the myth busters uh, doing things with fingerprints. Um, capturing irises, getting high resolution pictures of people's faces may be a security problem now. Uh, the users may be reluctant to give up your data. We need a finger prick for a little bit of uh, blood so you can log in. It's not bad as an auxiliary factor, but I'm not a big fan of, of these things. Getting out of the game. Uh, SSH has pass, you can log in with passwords on SSH. I think it's a big mistake. I see this all the time. Um, of course, my machine's skinny dip on the internet. I have no, no firewall protecting this machine. Uh, so anyone in the world is welcome to go attack SSH, and I get password attacks all the time. But I use, I never use passwords for SSH, almost never. Um, I use the DSA keys and lock those with passphrases when appropriate. Something like this, absolutely locked with strong passphrases. Gives me two-factor authentication. The dictionary attack is rare. You have to steal your and own the client first. It's too much going on. Reasonably secure clients, I think, are doable. Yes, Dan? So you lock your laptop, but you have to stop at my house Okay. I, I've lost my laptop, and I'm someplace where, at a friend's house, where I need to get into my machine. Too bad. Um, now, as it happens, I have two computers with me. I have my iPhone and my, my laptop, uh, which means it could happen. Usually what happens is, 
what would happen if I were in China and I lost my laptop, the phone call would go home to the neighbor and <laughs> the message would be shut down all my computers before they can break through, figure it out, and get into them, if my computers are really that big of interest to the Chinese. But in principle, yes? A putty and a key, yeah, okay. Um, now, if I got hands on that, I would be running a dictionary attack on your passphrase, I guess. Would it be successful? Good answer. And probably correct, but you know that Dan is meticulous enough about it that he's got a lot of entropy in his past phrases. So we're going to, which brings me to strong passwords. Okay, yes, Ches, we agree, but we can't change it. We need strong passwords now, or we need it for our key. What can we do? Well, I'm about to give you a sample of four passphrases that each have about 60 bits of entropy. 60 bits is a lot. If you need more than 60 bits, you really are in the wrong business. I suggest you probably need to have an armed marine as well. So here we go. The first passphrase, value part Peter sent some computer. Now not this particular one, but the way it was generated from the length of the words, list of words that this was chosen. This is about 60 bits. From a longer list of words, hence more bits per word, anxiety, materials, preparation, sample, experimental. I don't know if I'd remember that, okay? But it is a passphrase, and it's words. It's not eye of newt stuff. Or how about this one, also 60 bits. Bliss, rubbery, unseal, Irish. Now, that was uh, four words taken from a very long list of English words, hence a lot of bits. Um, and then there's this bottom one, which is just 60 bits in hex. Now, there are people who do this. Peter Honeyman does this. He prints that out, and he carries a sheet of paper around for a couple months until he memorizes it. Yes, sir? Do you know why he does that? Because he developed a, a dictionary attack using multiple words and found that he had an extraordinarily high success rate with just two words. Yes, two words is not enough. It's not nearly enough. You really need to have enough entropy in here um, if, if someone's doing a dictionary attack and you're serious about repelling it. And I have some more, more thoughts on this as we go on here. Um, so, you know, is that such a hard thing to memorize after a few months? I mean, obviously, I, I, it'd be a problem now, but after a while, I think that was easier when I was younger that I could remember that stuff. User choice is bad for entropy. Users are... This is bad engineering. Um, on the other hand, if you give them a word picked out of two to the 60th, if you give them a phrase, phrase, a set of words out of two to the 60th, and they don't like it, you can ask, they can certainly could ask for, give me six more, and try to hope that it's going to pick something out of this vast universe that might somehow be more memorable. Um, and they're going to write it down. Uh, who's going to remember these for a year? By the way, unseal. Uh, was a form of uh, script used in the 8th century and is the where we got capital letters from. So if you pick words from a very long list, you may actually expand your vocabulary in perhaps somewhat useless ways. Uh, these are much easier to type because they're words. Now, I'm pretty sure that my spell checker doesn't have unseal in it, uh, but it does have these other ones. Wouldn't it be nice that when you're typing or tapping, that a spelling checker be your friend. And I'm going to get, I have another half-baked idea I'll get to in a moment where we do this. Um, one thing which gets back sort of to Honeyman, uh, but actually to Ron Harden, was something he did in the late 80s, the uh, insult generator. <laughs> <laughs> you worrying pan broiler of bullious puff adder slobber. Now, let, I mean, this is sort of like the baseball sign thing where random input's okay. Here you get to cuss out your computer <coughs> in various interesting ways. By the way, you can get 10 generated just for you, and if you trust me, the entropy really is greater than 41 bits. If you assume I've got it right and FreeBSD's got it right, go to cheswick.com slash pw, and it'll give you 10 of these, and a fresh 10 every time. Go ahead, I've got Fios, let her rip. Uh, <laughs> This, it, there, this idea is also not new. Uh, there, there's a Mad Libs, a paper for Mad Libs uh, kind of passwords that you could do. Um, 
you blotted kibble of unhygienic wild sheep spittle. Now that's sort of fun to type in. Unfortunately, that won't pass many of the eye of newt rules. It has no letters in it, no, no uppercase letters, no digits. Um, it might be too long for some of them. And it's only 41 bits, which is actually almost better than almost every password in the world, but could be stronger. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, challenge speller. Yes. So I frequently use my intention, you know, my Spelling. Is it, is that, is oh, that? so so you misspell the words because you don't know any better, and does that help? Yes, that helps. Um, but uh, it depends, and I'm, I'm going to get to this, actually. Yeah, let, let me move on to this and show something. That helps because your password isn't a set of words, it's misspelled words, so it's something that it'd be harder for them to guess. On, on the other hand, I know this is 41 bits. Um, so, assuming my random number generator is good. Let, let's get a little more into this. So how about iPhone-friendly passwords? For those with an iPhone, pop up your uh, memo pad. We're not using the password input. And try tapping as fast as you can without making corrections, but making sure you get the space right. Grade likes, jokes, guess. And if you stand there and tap that quickly, um, if you make a mistake, a tapo, uh, the spelling checker is likely to correct it back to the word, even if you don't do anything about it. The spelling checker is helping you. And that's true for all of these words, more or less. This is really half-baked research. Honey learnt least lemon links. And you don't have to write these down because I'm going to give you a web page that gives you 10 words that are, that are in these, this, this thing later. So, What's the idea behind this? The idea is that there are a lot of words that are like a lot of other words. So if that's included in your password and you mistap it, it may go to the wrong word when it spell checks it or when you mistap it. However, if we pick words out of the dictionary that are a long distance from any corrections the dictionary is likely to make, the iPhone is more likely to go back to the word you meant. All right? This turns out, once you have this idea, it's about 15 minutes said script to go through and generate a list of 1024 words that are resistant to tapo errors. Um, first, let me show you a list, and you're not expected to be able to read all this, of bad words. Goes, as in he goes to the store. There are lots of different words in there that are kind of close from a spelling checker point of view. If, you're, if your fingers wander a little from where they work, there are lots of bad words. These would be bad iPhone passwords. The spelling checker is good, because you're going to enter the wrong word, or the spelling checker is going to go the wrong place. Let's try easier words. These. Scope, truly, habit, clerk, claim. Now, if you misspelled these, the spelling checker would probably put it back to here. Well, doesn't that make this less secure? No, because the words themselves are not the secret. I've got 1024 words, that's 10 bits of entropy, and I'm giving them a name, a nickname, one of these words. If you want 50 bits of entropy, you pick, well, you have a computer pick five words, that gives you 50 bits of entropy. And the fact that these might be resistant to spelling errors and so on is irrelevant. Okay? So, you could go to cheswick.com slash pw, and it will serve up 10 words for you. And if you trust me, you could actually get your strong passwords from there. Uh, I, should, I should put that up as uh, HTTPS, shouldn't I? Um, these are selected from that list. I'm working with a couple of students from Columbia to work on this and find out what sort of tapos people really make, and maybe do a usability study. Uh, this study, these words are based on me sitting on the train, madly typing as fast as I could for about 20 minutes um, on one trip, which is not really a thorough user study of uh, usability or errors or so on. But it is an idea, and we've got some students who are working on this, which might be kind of fun. Can do the same thing with the, um, the other restricted line, star hash zero layout, and the predictive text that a lot of use there. Oh. Okay, he's saying you could, you could use the same thing with telephone pad layouts and the number and the letters that are on them. Yeah. Right, and, and having them learn from your errors in this case is a good deal, 
right? Because you're not leaking data, it's actually helping you type things in better. This might make it more, more pleasant. Who knows? More advice. Oh, I had one other piece that's really sort of a little different, and I'm not, I thought about taking it out, but I said, no, this is important. Um, and it's a piece of another part of another talk anyway. Client certificates. Everyone worries about you connect to a bank, do you know you're really connecting to the bank and it's an important problem. I'm more concerned at the server end. I run an IMAP server and the world can reach that IMAP server and try it. And IMAP's IMAP service is a dangerous one. It deals with different usernames. It tends to have more privilege on the machine. If there's a bug in it, it, it is a potential port for breaking in. And what I'd like to do is have all my users who are allowed to connect to this IMAP service have a client certificate. And if you don't have the client certificate, you don't even get to play. You can't be present to win. Now, client certificates are pretty much overlooked on the internet. I suspect Apple's iMail has it in there because there's open SSL and stuff in there, but there's no user interface for it. It would be very nice to do this to, to restrict access. Now, I'm still running through the dangers of offering SSL, which shows you how paranoid I can get about security, um, but I, I'd like to see that happen. Okay, yeah, but. <laughs> you, all right, Chez, these are great ideas, but out in the real world, companies have big problems. They will take time to deploy if they ever do. There's a huge installed base, um, which I helped do. It's a little startling when I find people actually made decisions based on advice I gave in a book 20 years ago. Um, sometimes <laughs> there was one, we, we had people not have IP connectivity to the world. We thought that was a good idea, and it still has some appeal. But that meant they could do whatever they wanted with the address spaces on their intranet. There was a bank that said, fine, I've got 50 states, branches in 50 states, we're going to use a different class A address for each state. Uh, which meant they had to go back and sort of gather it all back in when they tried to control all of this. Um, corporate conglomerates have hundreds or thousands of sign-ons. So who owns the app? Who hosts it inside the company? Who was the guy who wrote it? Are they long gone? What would it take to change it? Who developed it? What's the business function? We need buy-in from all the parties. Development costs, what's it gonna cost to do this? And I say, fix it anyway. Come back here. Um, for example, hypothetically speaking, large companies merge with other large companies. Has Sun joined IBM yet, or is that it's still underway? Huh? Or? Not yet. Not yet, okay. I, I, Sun is joining Oracle? Yeah. No, that doesn't sound right. It is, okay. I, I obviously missed one day of the Wall Street Journal and missed who's joining whom. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know it's been a while. I haven't been watching that closely. Um, but the point is, when you do these mergers, and I've been part of lots of mergers and trivestitures and so on, when you do these mergers, there's a big eruption of cash for the merger. It's going to take $2 billion to bring these companies together. And the stockholders are told that these mergers, this is going to create synergies. It's going to make things less expensive because we're going to remove redundancies. Well, authentication servers are redundancies. This is the time to do it. Right? You need to know who your people are anyway. So the CEO maybe should spend five minutes saying, oh yeah, we should do that, make it happen. This is when it should happen because it sure as heck won't happen in five years if it doesn't happen now. Well, it might slowly do it. Um, they ought to be fairly simple to do. Authentication servers themselves are not hard to do. And if you that, don't... That, that's, that's not the issue. Okay, what is the issue? Teach me, Sensei. The, the issue is return on investment. Right? Well, yes. Commercial companies have finite dollars that they're willing to spend, and when they look at the applications, the, the dirty secret out there with identity management is there's tons of applications that will never, ever have that because it makes no That's right. ROI to do that. That's right. So, and ROI is, I've been in a security startup. They really want to know how much money are you going to save me. And if you can give them a useful number, you've got a sale. And if you don't, you're just part of the overhead and they're, they're battling it. Um, on the other hand, there are costs involved with misidentification, and most of those systems on corporate intranets do have some sort of authentication built into them already. If you can go rip out the old one and drop in a common one, that's a way of getting your arms around costs. That's my argument. I'm sticking with it. Uh, obviously, the, C <laughs> the CFO has to buy in. 
Um, but that seems to me to be the best time to do this. Uh, I, by the way, work at AT&T, uh, sorry, SBC, uh, and we still have domain names inside the company of sbc.com in some places. This stuff takes a long time, and there are a lot of problems. Um, also, another reason to fix it is that annoyed users are uncooperative users. Even if they're friendly, they, this can be a problem, and there's a lot of cost. So, strong passwords, strong authentication, not strong passwords. Multi-factor is good, but may be too expensive to deploy. Ubiquitous laptops can be used for middle-level level authentication. Um, I th actually think with the right security, something like a smartphone is probably going to be where a lot of our security is. And you just have to make sure you think through what happens when it falls in the wrong hands. I left this on the train yesterday. I was almost ready to step into Baltimore Station when someone said, did you leave a Mac on the train? Oh, crap. Uh, so, so I almost had a great emergency with this. Um, at least from a security point of view, I was not so worried. There are other things going here. Um, selling weaker passwords. I've had an ATM card since around 1973, different ones. They've always had four-bit pins, or four-digit pins, and they work. The reason they work is because they eat the card or disable the account. Um, so it doesn't have to be long, and this is cash. It cuts user support costs, which can be substantial. Backup passwords are weaker, I said that. Employee experience, annoyed users are less cooperative. And tell them I said it was probably a good idea. It's OK. Um, summary. Distribute and require client certificates. Use SSH, of course, crypto services. IMAPs and SMTPS. It's a little bit of a pain, but it's, it's worth going uh, IPsec. And frankly, people, we have to do better than this. The bad guys are way ahead of us. In fact, the good guys are way ahead of us on this. There's much more serious stuff going on. We should have had this solved by now. Things though I worry about these days. Dangerous browsing, dangerous patches, dangerous CPUs, hidden malware, and the bad guys are pros. They write fine code, and they get paid well for it. Dangerous browsing, all your iframes point to us. Even virtuous browsing can end up going to a uh, an advertising page that's dangerous. Uh, I recommend that paper. Dangerous patches. Ex automatic patch-based exploit generation. So they look at the patch, they figure out what was wrong in an automated fashion, a couple CPU seconds, and generate counterexamples. That's a couple of seconds. Provably hidden malware, another nice one from Don Song. Um, supply chain issues. This is a major headache for everyone. This was a paper, you take a Spark 7 chip, and they, this was out in Illinois, as I recall, yes. Um, you take the Spark 7 chip, and you change 1,300 transistors, and now it's no longer a safe CPU to run. Well, the thing that really got me was, how do you make it unsafe? You send the machine a UDP packet with a bad checksum. So it reads the checksum, and throws the packet, reads the, the packet, and throws it away. Meanwhile, that UDP packet had a sequence of data in it that when it appeared on the data bus, triggered the CPU to stop checking memory bounds. Oh. And, and you know, that's not hardly the worst thing you could do with this sort of stuff. Holy smokes. Um, so it looks like 120 slides comes out to about an hour. And I thank you for your time. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, sir. So like five, 10, or 20 years from now, are you going to be using passwords or pass, uh, uh, type, uh, uh, actions against uh, uh, user by user? I'm not seeing it get a whole lot better. Is it better now than it was in 1990? What do you think, Dan? I think that 30 I think that's probably true. Um, I, I don't see this getting that much better. I, at some places it will. Um, in some places, it's not really as broken as people might think. For example, online banking. How many people do it? You know, I get 80% responses in rooms full of security experts. 
Um, I submit to you that it's working, just as people are doing it. The banks know that they're getting screwed sometimes, but they generally know their loss level. So it's working. Yes? Yep. Um, the, the, you know, you could write an entire book on the subject. Or, <laughs> um, but Facebook does that. Facebook does it. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, there are other. It. I, I see. There, there's some use to that. Um, it means that something unusual is happening, and detecting unusual stuff is a good thing to check out. Yes, sir. Right. 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 Well, that, that's more credit card than bank. The, the, the account draining was a real problem a few years ago. That's right. Well, which is part of security. Um, uh, uh, getting back to your question about security in 20 years with biometrics. Uh, one of the problems is I'm afraid biometric spoofing, even of DNA, looks very plausible. Uh, you know, you give me your fingerprint, I run this little uh, high school grade lap, uh, wet chemistry thing and I make a DNA footprint of you. And of course, we're all sitting in here shedding samples right now. Uh, yeah, Dan. I'd ask to use the mic. Um, Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> So my, my bank's concerns are to reduce its own losses. Yes. Therefore, I believe that its security is reasonable, even though I look at some of its uh, protection mechanisms and go, eh, that's kind of lame. Yeah. Um, it also guarantees a limit to my losses to some degree, and my insurance company further limits my losses. That makes me less worried. Yes. But any individual point has me seriously concerned. It's just the combination that's reduced it. That's right. There, there's... Um a related one, you talk to any European uh, comparing U.S. credit cards with the European PIN cards and now the, the ones with the CPUs, oh, our, our credit cards in Europe are much more secure than you, 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 you Stone Age Americans who still you know, just swipe this thing. I have talked to the top security people at, at um, uh, MasterCard and Visa, and they said, we will never have those, those chip cards here in the U.S. Why? Because a local call is much cheaper here. So when the, someone swipes the card and it sends in and it queries the database and says, yes, it's okay, that is much more expensive and much scarcer in Europe. And that is why they went to the other solution. Um, just, just a little insight from talking to these folks. The Europeans are also very, very impressed that their bank PIN cards can go up to eight, pit, eight digits. And we only have four because we're stupid. Um, Though it turns out their eight-digit pins work on our machines when you do it. Uh, I'm not sure that's a big help either. You, you just get the whole date, not just the year when you do the pin. Yeah. <laughs> there was a real security advantage, at least in the UK, uh, when we did bring in chip and pin, and it was that your card doesn't leave your site. That was what actually changed the what brought the security. It was nothing to do with the battery chip and pin. Okay. Because of the introduction of chip and pin, um, the whole infrastructure for scanning a card had to change. You had to bring in these handheld terminals. So, they, so now the way to bring Right. And that's How come he doesn't have to use the microphone and you do? I'm walking to it. He's lazy. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm fit and hale and healthy. Um, I'm good looking, too, for those that are getting the live stream. Hey, modest. Don't forget modest. <laughs> so, um, computational passwords. Yeah. Where you give the user something and they have to compute something from it. Yeah. And, you know, hard computation is, of course, hard. But yeah. how about drive me to grandma's house? Uh-huh. Or, you know, something of that ilk where you, or here's a page from, from USA Today and use your secret algorithm to give me the, you know, fourth line of the article that has the headline that satisfies your requirement. Yeah, this, you, the code book. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you have to have the USA Today. And, and oh, but it's a page that gets displayed. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's, that's a challenge response sort of thing. And of course, the, 
Those generally work for one or two passwords just fine. If you do them for 20, usually someone who can watch the challenge and the response, uh, you know, there's SAT analysis and so on. The, the computers can break these down pretty quickly. And if you're really only looking for one or two emergency holographic passwords, maybe you just remember two words. You know, a one letter password only has one chance in 26 of being guessed the first time, I guess. That's not too bad. It's not great, but it's, it's better than wide open. All right, I think that's enough. Oh, okay, last question. No, the problem is the folks at home can't hear you. Thank you. There you go. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, quantum computing. and Quantum computing, yes. Square root of, 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 what is it, not? Yeah, the square root of not. And as far as, what is your take on, you know, someone talked about this uh, in terms of five, ten years from now. Do you think we're going to go into dictionary types of attacks using quantum computing? So instead of jillions, we're going to have quadrillions yeah. because a quantum computer is going to do any more. I'm saying get out of the game. Three is a good number. And I don't care how big your computer is, you get three attempts. And the best person to guess it is probably your spouse. And your non-moronic password, if your spouse can't guess it, is probably going to be just fine. So I'm not worried about that. I mean, they may crack public key cryptography, um, but that, you know, that's something else. Uh, we, we've got to stop trying to make people do that. It's just a bad idea and has been for a long time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff.